I'll recap a bit about what we did uh, yesterday. And then of course we, we go. So what did we talk about yesterday? Um, the main topic was, was, was Comanads. And I emphasized in some sense, there shouldn't be anything to say about them because they are just a formal dual of monads. But the question isn't what they are formally. The question is the pragmatics. What are these things good for? And then what would be examples of those things in non-self-dual settings, such as, for example, the category of sets and functions. <clears throat> OK. And um, I was emphasizing that while the definition is, again, a functor and two natural transformations, there is a certain intuition behind that we should keep in mind, which then was this, that we use comonads um, not to talk about notions of computation, but no, uh, which are like our notion of, say, clients that want something, but notions of um, environment or, or sort of servers that could respond to, uh, to those clients or services rather, perhaps I should say. And the way I understand an environment is a kind of an abstraction of a state machine, if you wish. It's a process that is able to serve computations and is at any moment in some state. And we don't really require anything more beyond that, <clears throat> but an environment typically uh, is given, especially in this co-free commonad like setting, really by, by a little state machine. So uh, <clears throat> you're, you're given a certain dynamics that tells you um, how you get from a state to a next one and uh, uh, what's the services that you can uh, sort of offer at this point. Uh, <clears throat> so the, you, 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 trans, you transition to the next state based on perhaps what the computation asks. And then there is some initial state given so that you can um, start applying this, this behavior from, from that uh, state. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the story. And the mnemonics here was, I always had X for um, uh, objects or sets of values. A y, capital Y are objects or sets of states. And DY are then environments that use uh, y as the state object or state set and ddy are complicated environments that use a sort of a structured state set so uh, states are no longer elements of y but the elements of dy so states are environments and the prime use of this was in the type of uh, this uh, polymorphic function that you always have present in a common ed called delta or co-multiplication. You can also think duplication. So this blows up a process like this into a more involved one uh, that is more or less the same, but uses a different state space. So uh, at any point in time, instead of the original state, it holds as the state the whole remainder of the process. The simplest example being D over Y is just streams over Y. So a sequence of states uh, that then the environment sort of goes through as it evolves over the time linearly. And then D of D of Y is the stream of suffixes of the original stream. And of course, the very first suffix is the stream itself, but every other um, suffix is, is then one element shorter. <clears throat> Okay, and then we looked, um, we, we said that all of the theory dualizes, blah, 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 blah. And we looked at some examples. Uh, <clears throat> these ones are maybe sort of important because they serve us as um, examples providing notions of environment for the types of computation that we care about, like reading or writing, uh, uh, you know, in the sense of, adding uh, uh, and also state. And then we also looked at the sort of general case, uh, which is the co-free co-algebras co-monad of a functor or the co-free co-monad of a functor. 
So given a functor, uh, the commonad applied to y are non-well-founded trees. In the case of the free monad, it was well-founded trees. Non-well-founded means paths in the tree can be inf infinite. And the labels are in a different place. Uh, so there is no leaf option other than if G allows it, that, but there is no explicit leaf option. So we're not talking about labeling leaves, rather we la label every branching node with a state. Um, <clears throat> The simplest case actually is if the functor we start with is identity, because then we are after a fixed point of the equation dy equals y times dy. Uh, and the greatest fixed point solution here is streams of y. Yeah, a stream has a stream over y has as head an element of y, and as a tail, something that again is a stream. Yeah, that's the, the recursive type definition here. So that's um, that's the co-free uh, commonad on the identity functor. But then there are, we, we saw other examples. And the one that I finished with was something that we could call an intentional co-state commonad. Uh, this will provide us an environment that can talk to computations in the intentional state monad. And what was it there? So uh, an element is a non-well-founded tree. So what do I see at every node? I see a node label. I see an element of S. So that's the data value. Uh, me as the environment is willing to give to the computation if that one wants to read or fetch. Uh, uh, so in this case, there is also uh, how the environment continues. So there is an immediate subtree here. And there is also, uh, I mean, it's not really up to us to decide if the uh, environment wants, uh, sorry, if the computation wants to read or write. The computation is the master, we are the slaves here. So uh, <clears throat> if the computation wants to write, then we listen. And depending on what we see coming, data value in S, we continue in, in one way. So here there is S many children. Okay. And if you have these infinite trees like this, they can represent uh, environments that are not very faithful. So they can, for example, choose to give different answers to two consecutive reads, which is not what you want. And also, like they can. Uh, they can just see a write, and then if after that there is a read, they can give back the wrong uh, data value. All this is possible, but if you cut down these trees to those ones that actually follow the uh, co-state contract, so to say, then actually you can normalize these trees to this form. Uh, uh, this is a, a very compact uh, representation. So uh, uh, a co-state, extensional co-state co uh, environment is willing to give the computation a data value if it wants to read and if it wants to write, then the environment listens and uh, returns or finishes, I should rather say, in some state. Um, let me show you the same also in, uh, in Haskell to give you a bit of feel for this. Uh, I know how to show it differently. No. Uh, how do I do this? Share the whole thing. Yes. So here is one little a file where I've written out a number of, of, of commonads uh, and it's actually used or imported to the file where we work with interaction laws today. So a commonad is a functor coming with two polymorphic functions, as, uh, as I told you. 
So you can extract the initial state of any environment, and then also you can blow an environment into an environment using environments as states. And these states here actually are remainders of the environment at any point in time. And the, the, the small examples that I showed to you were, um, for example, the co-reader co-monad, which just comes from pairing. So, so D of Y, there is um, S times Y, so pairs of S and Y. The co-unit just extracts the Y, the co-multiplication uh, somehow duplicates the state, the Y stays the same. A co-writer uses function space, right? So if P is a monoid, then we get this co-monad uh, defined as dy, maybe I should show it here on the side. dy is p arrows y. This is what is happening in, in the mathematical notation. And uh, the co-unit somehow has to extract the y. The only way to do this is to uh, apply the given function from p to y to the unit of the monoid. You know, the distinguished element of the monoid in Haskell, you call it MMT. And co-multiplication then has to turn a function P arrows Y into a function P arrows P arrows Y. Uh, so you have to take in two different Ps uh, and then you have, uh, have to apply F to one single P. And the way that you make it is you use the binary operation of the monoid that you normally call the multiplication of the monoid. Similarly, co-state common ads. But then these uh, co-free ones, they, they are interesting, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, maybe I should first show you the general version of it. Where is that now? So here we had these um, uh, non-well-founded uh, node-labeled trees. So uh, if the functor given is f, then uh, the corresponding co-free monad applied to y is, uh, is a tree, right? So there is always the node label. Uh, and then there is the branching structure. Uh, the functor determines it. And every child roots a tree again, right? And then what happens, for example, for the co-unit is you just extract the root label. So that's, uh, think of the tree as, as your process, the environment. So at the root, you have the initial state. And co-multiplication is the one that you should provide, that should send a tree into a tree where nodes are labeled by trees or into an environment where states are further environments. And what we do is, uh, uh, <clears throat> so given a tree like this, uh, where the subtrees are CTS. Uh, so we use the whole given tree as the label of the root, and then recursively we apply co-multiplication at the children. And I have to use that uh, the inducing functor F here is, is really a functor, so we use F map. Okay, so, uh, and, and then you would get the, the particular co-free commonads as, as specific examples. So one that we could do in this way is, is, is the one that you see here on this, on the side. And it is, um, it is this um, intentional version of the co-state commonad. <clears throat> So here I actually use record notation for these non-well-founded trees. Well, in Haskell, we can't insist that it's not well-founded, but uh, we, we can keep it in mind as, as something that we intend. So um, an environment in this case for the state set Y is what? It is a tree that is represented here as a recursive, maybe I should say co-recursive record with three fields corresponding to the three projections that you could imagine here, right? So you could extract the root label or I mean, the root label is one of the fields and the corresponding um, field selector, we could call it co-ret. So then um, um, th th there are these things, a data value I'm, I'm willing to return if I'm the environment and continue somehow. So that's a field selector that we call co-get here. 
it's this pair type here, this product type. And then finally, this function space that corresponds to when the uh, computation wants to put. So we are happy to co-put, so to say. So we listen to what the computation wants to write and we change our state accordingly. <laughs> this one says fmap undefined. It's not because it cannot be defined, but because I forgot. No, nobody forced me to do this here. <clears throat> so, uh, <laughs> And then what, 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 what is this co-monad uh, structure, right? I have to define the co-unit and co-multiplication. Co-unit is really co -ret. And co-multiplication we do, as I explained before. Um, so uh, <clears throat> co uh, in the new thing is actually the whole environment. Yeah, not the initial state, but the whole environment. And co get then and co boot are, uh, are given um, uh, recursively. Um, <clears throat> right. Uh, so the F map here is the F map of pairs. Maybe I should have written it differently. And this is the F map of uh, function space that is already sort of spelled out so you can't see it here. But it's just recursive calls of Como. Is this good? I mean, there is more to be said here, but this should be enough for us to move on to, um, to the topic of interaction laws. Let me see about the questions here. Um, is it possible to define co-monads in Haskell using just the definition that it is a monad in the opposite category? Well, you could if you program, so, so what we are doing right now in Haskell is that we're defining monads and co-monads um, sort of of the ambient category Hask in which we are, so to say, when we write Haskell programs. But, but you could do a different thing and that also came up in the Slack channel discussion. So uh, um, inside Haskell, you could start programming other categories. And it's easy, especially to do it with categories that have the same objects as the ambient category, namely Hask. So as objects have a Haskell types, but as maps, maybe you want to have something else. So then you could, for example, define your category as a type class, which would say just what, uh, what the maps are between any two objects here types. Uh, you can also do general categories using associated types or something like this. So more complicated advanced Haskell tricks, trickery. Uh, but then if, if you do this, so you build your little embedded DSL of categories inside Haskell, then really you, you, you can indeed do what, what, what was suggested here in the question. Then you could define um, in Haskell what it means you know, what is, what is the opposite category of a given category? So you can define the opposite category to start with. And then you could define that the co-monad is nothing else than a monad in the opposite category. So that would be possible, but only if it's this DSL approach. But if we're, if we're, just, uh, um, if we're just talking about uh, uh, not the category we made ourselves in Haskell, but the category that Haskell is, then of course this doesn't, uh, uh, work. Let me answer the other questions as well. The concept of sub monad from the slide or sub monad is straightforward like a sub object. Yes. So the slide somehow jumped. I'm sorry for this. Yes. So, 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 so really it is. So it's defined here. So a sub monad is, uh, is, is given by a, so we've got this underlying functor. We take a sub functor of it and that one is given point wise. So, Really, for every y, we have the dy here, which is some set of trees or some object of trees, maybe I should say more generally. And then we cut it down. Um, so in, in, in sets, this is really about subsets. Otherwise, it's we, we take a certain sub-object of dy. So point-wise, for every y, we take a sub-object of dy, and this will give us a sub-monad if we are careful enough. Uh, <clears throat> uh, to make sure that we really uh, 
sort of do this, um, cutting down uh, the different, sorry, cu cutting down dy for, for different y, y in a sort of sufficiently uniform way. Uh, another question, why don't the commonal laws get rid of the bad trees in the intentional co-state commonad? I think I'm confused about the fact that in the intentional state monad, it's not as though we can encode bad stateful computation trees. Is this badness something that only shows up in the commonad setting? Yes. Mm, it is. So it is, it is really the duality of quotients on one hand and uh, sub-objects on the other. Uh, <clears throat> so in the monad world, you, um, I mean, one way to build monads, that's the sort of algebraic theory way, is that you start with a free monad, uh, in which case you have a very clear idea of what you want your basic actions, basic effectful actions in your computations to be. Yeah, those will be the sort of algebraic operations of the monad. And then you say, okay, these trees are too many. They are all good, but they are too different. <laughs> and then you start identifying some of the trees. Like in the case of non-determinism, you would say, you know, a tree with three leaves labeled A, B, C, then it doesn't matter which, which, which way the tree looks like. It's all, all, all that matters is that the frontier of leaf labels is ABC, yeah? Which is associativity because the way that you could reach it is you could first binary branch and then maybe in the, you know, at the left child, you binary branch again, and then you have labels AB and then uh, at the second binary branch, you have the label C, but, but it could be that first you have a binary branch and then in the second case you have a further binary branch which altogether gives you a branching which altogether gives you three options so you identify those and now in this co-free or in, in this similar construction of co-monads starting from operations you might want to call them co-operations people do the story is all of a sudden different so you first build these uh, completely unconstrained node labeled trees Note label tree types or sets. So, so, so this is what these co-free commonads are. But, but then you don't identify trees. Instead, uh, instead you prune. <laughs> Not in the sense of pruning trees, but you just leave out some trees, trees that don't follow a certain contract. The commonad laws, the commonad equations, don't rule out any bad behavior. So, uh, so think, for example, of this example of streams and suffixes. Uh, so that is one special case. I think it's on the previous slide, right? Um, the Komonad equations simply hold. They say something about how, uh, you know, the operations of taking the head of a stream and uh, uh, blowing up a stream into a stream of its suffixes, they agree well together, right? Because, for example, if you take a stream, blow it into a stream of suffixes, take the head, uh, you've got the first suffix, which was the whole original stream, or maybe you don't take the head of your stream of suffixes, but you actually map head over your stream of suffixes. You take the head of every suffix, but that restores again the original stream. And then there is also a story about how you uh, can blow up, uh, you know, a stream twice, getting a stream over stream over streams uh, in two ways, and these these agree. This has nothing to do with 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 ruling ruling out bad behavior, uh, really. Uh, um, yeah, I should try to give more intuition here, but I think it's, it's, it's difficult at this stage, um, uh, especially uh, <laughs> in front of 60 people and trying to, trying to invent, uh, invent something, maybe drawing could help. Okay, but now let's then go on to the topic of today, interaction laws. So effects happen in interaction to run an effectful or effect requesting program 
yeah, piece of syntax, which we abstract into a computation. Always think of these trees, like you have in the case of free monads or, or, or equivalence classes of such trees, like you have in the case of the state monad or, or non-empty list monad, for example. These need to interact with an environment that an effect providing or co-effect. So an effectful program doesn't run alone. Um, <laughs> if you look at it honestly, right? So uh, in pure functional programming, uh, there is no state. So if you've written your Haskell code with do, and then you say get, <laughs> uh, th there has, has to be something that, that, that responds, right? Uh, <clears throat> which are actually these sort of little run functions that you often write for, uh, for your monads. Uh, <clears throat> so here are some examples. A non-deterministic program, for example, has these choice points in the code, which says, do this or do that. But um, a computation as such um, doesn't make up its mind. <laughs> uh, so this is outsourced to the world the world decides, yeah, it costs a die for you. So then a stateful program needs a memory service, right? So it needs kind of a machine to talk to. Like think of old days pocket calculators, you can put the thing in a memory, then you can recall from the memory. So that's exactly what it is. So you need a machine coherently responding to fetch and store or read and write commands. And by coherently, I mean, uh, not cheating, right? So if, if I want to memorize something, then the point is when I want to recall what the value was and ask, I should get back what I put there. Uh, so let's see if, if the machinery we built is, is now enough to, to, um, to model this. Why am I sharing? Am I sharing two screens now? Uh, that's not good. Uh, um, uh, I'll show you some more Haskell code, but, but let's, let's stick here for the time being. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, here's a definition <laughs> right away, uh, uh, which I'll again try to talk you through and then start giving examples. So like before, let's assume that at least products are there or in, in, in terms of Haskell pair types. Um, then we can talk about the following thing. So suppose we are given a monad, intuitively means we have some notion of computation in mind, like maybe we want to do state today. And then you're also given a co-monad, which means you have some notion of environment in mind, like maybe co-state, but maybe something different. So these two data have to be there, but they have to be connected together by something. And that's sort of the interaction law proper. Um, so officially an interaction law is three components, a monad, a co-monad, and this, which is what? It's a natural transformation psi like this. Um, it's a polymorphic function um, indexed by x and y, natural in both. And you go from tx times dy to x times y. What on earth is this? So here is your little legend. So what, what you, what psi gets is a computation over a certain value type, a computation supposed to return values in type X, it also gets an environment using Y as the state space. And then these two do stuff together and out is supposed to come what? Um, a return value and a final state. A final in the sense that really the computation returns a value and then it doesn't care about the potentiality of the environment to go on. The environment is sort of halted or, or at least you take a snapshot of it uh, at the state after which you don't care about it anymore. Uh, so in that sense, the final state. Uh, <clears throat> the state the environment is in uh, at the point when the computation returns. Does it make sense? Yeah, so it's a client talking to a server and uh, they somehow understand each other, the outcome and X in the Y. 
And again, like always in these uh, stories, there are some quality criteria, right? In this case, it's the following. <clears throat> so you'd expect that if the computation is trivial, then not much happens, right? And then also you expect that if a computation is actually a sequence of two computations or a computation into which you've grafted further computations, then uh, interacting with a sequence should somehow be correlated with interacting uh, with the outer computation and then interacting with the inner computation, one after another. So instead of one big interaction like a two-phase, uh, phase like pH, a two-phase interaction. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. This becomes very nice and symmetric. These pictures. So, so red is always the the the, the computation side everywhere here, and and blue is the environment side. Just so you see. So suppose I've got a computation that is actually trivial. Then I want to say. Uh, to interact should be the same actually as to start with your value that is the basis of the trivial computation and the environment just throw away the environment only keep the initial state and and return uh, so the initial state in this case is the final state because nothing nothing is done in the interaction uh, it, it stops before it starts or it stops the moment it starts if you wish Okay. Where did my chat go? Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so this one here is about compositionality. So let's see. I've got a computation of computations, which I uh, sequence into a single computation using multiplication of the monad. Then I interact, X and Y come back. That should be the same as blowing up the given environment. Ha! Huh. Now I've got an environment which I said I'm sort of ready to to um, to pause, if you wish, at any point to later resume, so to say. So uh, so here is this computation of computations. So here is an environment that uses remainders. So that uses environments as states, but partic in, in particular, for any point in time or, or, or in the logic <laughs> of this environment, you, you just have the remainder of the environment from that point on. So what can we do? The outer layers can interact and what, <laughs> what comes back, what should come back is the return value, but the return value here is, the inner, is some inner computation. Uh, and, and then there is some final state, but very cleverly, the final state is the remainder of the original environment, isn't it? And then these two can interact and out should come, or back to us should come a final, uh, sorry, a return value and a state. And these are really um, the, uh, the, the ultimate return value and the, the final state, right? Uh, <clears throat> is this good? Let's look at some examples. Why doesn't it move? For the reader and co-reader, these ones can be put uh, together like this. Not even for exactly the same state space. We could we could play the game that uh, that the uh, that the computation works with a view of the state, and uh, <laughs> the environment works with a real state, so to see, so to say. Uh, there is a question. Uh, should there also be an equality between the two occurrences of dx and y, dx and dy, where? Um, you mean here? Can you answer? No, these are very different things because that's actually where we start. Uh, so that's the computation that hasn't run at all yet. And uh, this is the original environment, yeah? Whereas here, uh, the, uh, the outer computation has already run. And this is just, uh, you know, the residual of some, or remainder of some original, uh, of the original environment. So, so these two are not equal, uh, absolutely not. But that's a very good question. Uh, 
<clears throat> okay, so then, uh, uh, yeah, I, I said uh, I can make a, a reader monad and a co-reader co-monad uh, talk to each other if they use the same state object, but we, we can go a tiny bit more general easily because the reader can work with a certain view of the state and the, sorry, the computation can work with a certain view of the state while the environment can work with a with the with the, with the real state or, or or master copy of the state if you wish right so all i need is that i can project from the sort of master state to the view let's call it c for conversion i suppose so then how do the two talk well i'm given a function like this i'm given a pair like this here right so what can i possibly do well i can try to plug in uh, the s0 into f which I can do after conversion, then I get an X and the Y I just have from the original pair, right? So that's the interaction, short as it is. State, we can play exactly the same game. Uh, also for the fun of it, I'm showing, uh, uh, again, uh, the state monad and the co-state monad operating on different state uh, objects or sets, S and S0. So here, interaction works nicely if uh, I can go from the source to the view, but I can also reflect the view back to the source in the way that it is done in a very well-behaved lens. Uh, if you don't know what it is, Maybe for the moment, you shouldn't worry about this. Just think S equals S0, and this is identity, and this is the second projection. So that is a special case and sort of the main one. Now, how does the interaction go? Uh, it's, it's not so difficult, right? So this guy wants to read. This guy can provide something. So the first thing we can do is, is apply this function here to an element, to, to, to the element provided, sorry, S0 uh, after a suitable conversion. Then we get to some state as prime in here, and then x. So the x is the one that we actually eventually return, but now we also have to uh, take care of the y. So now I can use s0 and s prime in combination, uh, applying this function d. Um, to, to, to manufacture an element of S0, and then I just apply G to it, and I do get an element of Y. Now, this picture is getting a bit complicated. I, I should maybe emphasize one point here. So the word state is used in two senses here. <laughs> so, and there is two state, or, or maybe even three <laughs> state sets involved, because we've got these final values that we want to return from the computation. The environment works over some internal state set, let me think of them as control states. But then both of them talk to each other in terms of some other states, which are data states, so to say, have nothing to do with control. And, uh, and they work with slightly different representations of them. I mean, uh, the computation has a partial view and uh, the environment has a full view, so to say. Um, let's do something more interesting let's see if i can make uh, the intentional non-determinism monads to talk to some guy so this was binary leaf trees wasn't it so what i need on the other side well i should simply need a guy that is always in a state and then it continues or continues and i put plus here you could also, I could have written bool times W, but I chose to write W plus W, then it kind of looks more dual, but it's the same thing. So here the idea is the environment makes these little choices. So here there is a binary leaf tree. Interaction will, ex will extract one leaf from the leaf tree, but the environment will tell you which, because at any stage, based on the state in which it is, it will figure out, um, where it wants to direct the computation, to the left or to the right at this point. Uh, and that's your code. Uh, and the same for state. Um, intentional state is sort of easy to play with. So I, I, here I simplified it. Again, we could play with different state sets and using a lens, but here I just wrote it simpler using, uh, making both use the same state set. So here I have these leaf labeled trees. 
every three and they're finite uh, at least uh, ideally i mean you can also model non-determinism but that's a slightly different story in haskell it's modeled because we are not in sets but we're in domains um, but there is also th set theoretic modeling based on what is called a delay monad so uh, every tree is either a leaf or it's uh, a branching node of this type or a branching node of this type. Here you branch, uh, here you have as many children, here you have exactly one child. Uh, now this guy has as many plus one children at every node plus at every node it has a node label. And this guy then is able to talk to that one. Maybe we should look at that in, uh, in, in, in Haskell actually. And then I start to speak faster. When I've covered the examples, I'll tell you, where do these things come from? Um, <clears throat> um, share screen differently. Is this happening? Now you should see two buffers, I hope, and maybe a bit more. Let me check if there is a question. No, not yet. Um, but that's the wrong file. Uh, Okay. <clears throat> Do I want to say this? Maybe, maybe I, I, I make one more step. Uh, <clears throat> so these are monad, co-monad interaction laws. And uh, when I don't put the qualifier and I say interaction law, I always mean monad, co-monad interaction laws. But there is actually a more basic thing. And let me first mention this because in, in the Haskell code, it comes first. So you could also talk about interaction between two functors. Um, and it's much simpler. <laughs> so it is two endofunctors and the family of maps, again, natural in the indices X and Y. But there are no side conditions because there is no unit, co-unit, no multiplication, no co-multiplication to talk of. Um, and you could say this F here is, again, a notion of computation and G is a notion of environment, but it's kind of in a poor setting. So monads give you great notions of computations that are closed under doing nothing and sequ sequential computation, which is like primitives you want from any programming language. You should always be able to do nothing, right? That's what we all want, do nothing. And you should always also be able to sequentially compose. But, but this is not provided here. I mean, a functor is not closed under these things, but what a monad is, uh, I mean, what, what the unit and the co-multiplication say is our notion of computation is closed under just returning or doing nothing, whichever you want to call it, and sequential composition. Uh, why is this relevant? Actually, this allows you to say that just like monads are monoids in endofunctors and co-monads are co-monoids in endofunctors, interaction laws are also actually monoids. Uh, why? Because uh, you can define not only what a functor functor interaction law is, but what is a map between two such things. You can define what the identity interaction law is and what the composition, or sorry, what the, yeah, and what the composition of two uh, functor functor interaction law maps is. Uh, and then you get a category out of functor functor interaction laws. And then it turns out the monoid objects in this category are exactly monad commonad interaction laws. So there is something very canonical about monad commonad interaction laws. I mean, it's not something that we came up with without a license. I mean, the mathematics really justifies it. Uh, uh, an interaction law map actually is a cool thing. So what is it? It's two interaction laws, both given by a pair of functors and the natural transformation. But then uh, a map between two, them so the source and the target is what? It's a map between the Fs in the forward direction or natural transformation, I should say, between the Fs in the forward direction and the natural transformation between the Gs in the backward direction such that this pentagon or rather I should say uh, square commutes because one of the sides is identity here. Um, and there are reasons why this is sort of canonical. It comes up in mathematics. It's related to something called chew spaces um, and unrelated to chewing gum. Uh, um, okay, so we could code this up in, uh, in, uh, in Haskell, 
So for two functors, I can say a functor-functor interaction law is just a polymorphic function like this. <laughs> and then what is a monad-comonad interaction law? Where is that? Uh, it's here. Let me move the other thing further down. It's just a monad, a comonad, and a functor-functor interaction law between T and T, D. So if, if two things are a monad and a comonad, then they're surely functor as well because of how I set up my type class hierarchy. And then I say, okay, I've got a monad comrade interaction law. And I don't add any method here. So that's the fun part of Haskell. So I, I'm adding equational laws here, but of course in Haskell, I can't write them down. <laughs> in Agda, I would need to now add, uh, I mean, I would model these things as record types and uh, uh, and here I'd have three more fields, which are, sorry, two more fields, which are the proofs of the two quality criteria. But in Haskell, it's just like this. Okay, so for every instance, I really have to take responsibility and say, if I want something that is a functor-functor interaction law, if I want to also announce it to be a monad commonad interaction law because it satisfies the quality criteria, or if I don't make this instance declaration. And then you can code up your things, reader monad, writer monad, um, interaction laws, the canonical ones. And here's the one for, for, the, free, uh, for the free monads. And here it looks very, very short. <laughs> so uh, so I'm, I'm making trees and code trees to interact. Trees are my uh, well-founded leaf label trees. Code trees are my uh, non-well-founded node, branching node label trees. And the interaction is just this. So it's, it's driven by the first guy. It's driven by the computation, which is a leaf label tree. If I'm at a leaf, I just extract the root label of the given uh, node label tree. And that's it. Otherwise, uh, I've got a branching node here, and here is some little f structure, right? F determines the branching. So it's, it's, it's some children uh, rooting some trees TS, uh, and the branching is in a certain way dictated by F. Here then this root label doesn't count, and what you need to do is inter inter, and that's maybe a bit difficult to read. <laughs> what is this? The, the, the outer inter here is the interaction law between F and G, and the inner inter here is actually the uh, recursive call to the interaction law between uh, tree F and co tree G. So these have different uh, types. Okay. Now this is all very nice, but I'll tell you this doesn't work. Um, <laughs> why? Because imagine uh, T is the maybe monad. So do you think you can write the polymorphic function that uh, takes an element in, in this maybe monad, which is x plus one or one plus x, uh, and always gives you an x. It has to be a polymorphic one, yeah? And natural. So th there is no notion in sets, at least, like uh, of a default element uh, in a set. Actually, we, we could make it even worse. X could be the empty set. So how do you go from one plus zero to zero? There is no such way. So it looks like there is some notions of computation that can't perfectly interact. So there will be some residue. So some requests for services can be met by an outside environment and some are just hopeless. Like if the computation says, I want to raise an exception, then what can you possibly do about it? You can't invent uh, a final value then. So differently from handlers, here, these are natural transformations. You have to do something that is completely uniform in X and Y. And interaction law really just plays with data structures, sends uh, these values and states around, but can never look at them. Yeah, it just chooses between them. It copies, discards, shuffles stuff around, but it can never do stuff. It can never do maximum or 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 and. Uh, do you see this? Right. So that looks like a problem. So let me identify the problem. <clears throat> so 
So if your category has well-behaved co-products in the sense of extensi extensivity, and it doesn't matter right now, has this property, then bad, then we can yeah, make some statements about stuff that are bad. So if, if a functor has a nullary operation, so there is a natural family of maps from one to f of x, so like you can actually choose an element, um, or if your functor comes with a binary commutative operation, by which I mean a family of maps, C capital X, X times X to FX, naturally in X, such that it doesn't matter if you apply the operation or you first swap the arguments and then apply the operation. So it, it is commutative, really. If, in, if, if such a functor interacts with some functor G, then this functor G is constantly zero. So it's completely uninteresting. You're talking to a notion of environment that operates on the empty state set. So you can't even get started there because you can't choose an initial state uh, to see this. So functors like maybe or functors like uh, uh, non-empty multiset and of course possibly empty multiset as well, they are bad because of that. There is more. So uh, this cannot be stated for functors, but it can be stated for monads. So if the monad has a binary associative operation, um, again, C goes from X times X to T of X, naturally in X, such that um, two ways of getting from three X's to T of X give the same result. Um, then any interaction law of the monad with some co-monad is pretty impoverished in some sense, which I'll comment on. But let me just comment on this one first. So if you've got a binary operation that takes X and X to T of X, then uh, you can actually get from three X is also to T of X. How? Well, you apply the binary operation to the first two X's, you get T of X. Uh, and with eta, you go from X to T of X. Now you have t of x and t of x. You can use the operation again, but that gives you two t's of x. I mean, t of t of x, and then you can flatten. That's one way. But of course, you could, you could actually first use associativity and start applying the binary operation to the second and third, and then uh, uh, combine the first one with a result only. So that's about associativity. So uh, non-empty lists are like this, because there, there is a binary associative operation, namely the doubleton operation. Take two elements and make a doubleton list. It is associative in this sense. Then it turns out that any interaction law of this monad with any co-monad whatsoever is a bit uninteresting. And let me say in what sense uninteresting. It is uninteresting in the sense that if you interact, then the interaction cannot choose all of the potential return values that are there in the computation. So suppose it's non-determinism. I start out with three X's. So I made a binary choice between two X's and then there is a further binary choice and a further X is a possibility. If I interact like this, that is sure to factorize via first forgetting the middle guy and then interacting. So uh, more generally, if you've got a long list of elements, then the interaction law necessarily, or, or it's, it's, it's an unavoidable fact that uh, the interaction law cannot choose any of the middle elements of, of the list, only the very first and very last. Uh, and uh, this happens because um, doing so would go against this quality criterion. And it's a good exercise to think why I can't go into this detail right now. Okay, then what's the fix? The fix is, um, enter residual interaction laws. They are just a tiny generalization. So we, we have a monad, or maybe, why is this one here? This slide is in the wrong order. Uh, yeah, this is good. So <laughs> we start with, uh, we, we already had a monad and the co-monad. We add another monad, and that is for the, um, for saying that in the end, we don't necessarily get back a value and a final state, but we can get back a residual computation 
of the pair of a value and the final state. So, so perhaps, especially if T has this potentiality of raising an exception, or maybe like presenting me with a nullary choice in non-determinism, which is kind of the same thing, then maybe as R, we could use the maybe monad. Maybe we could use the maybe monad, yes. <laughs> and then what comes back is not a pair of a, a return value and a final state, but possibly a pair of a return value and a final state. And it's possible that we just get nothing, which happens in maybe monad, right? And the quality criteria are the same as before, but you have to plug in the R at the right places. Um, uh, so here, for example, when I interact, I, I get an R. When I, when I choose not to interact, I don't get an R, but I can mediate between the two by just, you know, seeing this pair trivially as, as an effectful computation using the unit of R. And here, similarly, I had uh, on one hand, one interaction, on the other hand, two interactions. So this gives me a different amount of R's here outside. So here I get a computation of computations giving uh, a value and a state. Here it's just a computation giving a value and a state, but I can sequence the two computations, right? So that makes sense. Now, again, uh, you can also talk about residual functor functor interaction laws. They are simpler. So uh, instead of a monad and the co monad and the monad, you just have a functor and the functor and the monad. And you would ask, why still keep a monad? The reason is I still want to say, uh, monad commonad interaction laws are monoids in a certain category. So for that, I need a monoidal category. And the one that I will make of functor functor interaction laws, residual functor functor interaction laws, won't be monoidal unless this R has a monad structure on it. Now, what's, what's, what's the simplest example here? Could, for example, be intentional non-determinism. So this you cannot properly interact with at all without a residual monad. So there has to be some residual effect. Why? So if we have nullary choice included in my notion of non intentional non-determinism, then what is, <laughs> yeah, what is a computation? A computation is either that I'm already finished or that something went wrong. I'm presented with a nullary choice, so I can't go ahead. I'm stuck. Or there is two computations to, to carry on with, and the choice will be made by the environment. Now, the notion of environment is exactly the same as before, but to treat this case here, that the computation gets stuck, we can actually work with a residual monad, and that's presented somewhere here. Um, where? Yeah, exactly here. So here there is the co-monad for um, intentional non-determinism here. And then there is an interaction which looks pretty much like I showed on the slide before, but you end up in the maybe monad. So in the case where the computation is not a binary choice, but it's a nullary choice, you choose to do nothing. The rest of the definition is, is similar. Okay, questions so far? Doesn't inter NDTS always loop? Was it, um, was it above here? Um, I think that's a question I missed before. Where on earth is it? No, it doesn't. Uh, it really doesn't. Uh, uh, so if this tree here, if, if you're given tree, sorry, if, if this tree is well-founded, then you will actually uh, finish. Because at every stage, you consume a constructor. But you're right in that this is not obviously a structurally recursive definition. So there has to be some reasoning why this is good. Uh, OK. Now, here's an interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> given a functor or a monad or a comonad, is there a greatest functor, comonad or monad interacting with it in the sense that if I have a notion of computation, I'd like to have a universal notion of environment that always works with me. 
So think, for example, I'm doing stateful computation. It's reasonable to expect that the right notion of environment is co-stateful computation, right? Of course, I could serve a stateful computation with a notion of environment that is not only able to manipulate state, but is also enable, uh, able to bring you coffee and pizza, et cetera. But these are services that you, didn't, that you don't really require ever in your stateful computations, right? So, uh, so in that sense, somehow, <laughs> The, the, the commoner that apart from manipulating state for you also you know, pays other services to you is, um, is, is sort of laxer, right? It, um, it's, it's not the tightest one that I could work with. I mean, I'm putting greatest and smallest in, in quotes here anyway, or in, in inverted commas, because all of this is metaphorical. After all, actually we're talking about sort of a universal construction. So can I find a universal D for T, such that any interaction law between T and D actually um, uh, factors through an interaction law between T and this question mark, which is this universal commonad here, just by using some canonical commonad map between D and question mark. Okay. The same question can also be asked if the residual monad R is there, but we don't do it for now. It turns out that to find a monad for a co-monad is easy and to find the co-monad for a monad is hard. And the problems are not symmetric at all. Now, why does this happen? We, we thought monads and co-monads are dual, but it happens because monads and co-monads are certainly, most certainly not the, used in any dual way in the concept of interaction law, right? So we're putting both T and D to the right of an arrow here. I mean, that's an interaction law in sort of similar positions. So uh, it looks like they are two things of the same kind, but then they aren't. So monads and co-monads are dual concepts, uh, but uh, uh, the concept of interaction law doesn't uh, use them uh, Duality, following this duality, right? And, uh, and, and this makes the whole thing non self dual now. Uh, let me tell you one thing. No, why is this? Yes. Uh, one thing is easy. So if you're given a functor, you can formally define its dual. So given a functor G, I can formally define G sir. That is also an endo functor. And it's given by a terrible thing called an end, which is a bit of category theory, but you can just think a universal quantifier instead of this uh, for all sign here for practical purposes. So the dual of G applied to X is the function space for all Y, G Y to X times Y, or this, uh, this space of polymorphic functions uh, like this for every y maps from g y to x times y. I mean, this is not necessarily defined in uh, for all categories because these ends don't need to exist, but let's pretend they do. Uh, and uh, you can always cut down an end of functor category down to these uh, end of functors that are closed. Uh, uh, yeah, for which these exist. Repeatedly. Um, so this uh, circ itself is a functor. G is used uh, in a contravariant position here. So it goes from the opposite of end of functors to end of functors. And there is more to be said, but none of it is very important. What is important is G circ is the greatest functor interacting with G, or it's the canonical one. For the following reason, the, these three things are exactly the same. Functor functor interaction laws are in bijection. So what was a functor functor interaction law? It was a pair of an F and a G and then a natural transformation phi. Those are in bijection with pairs of functors F and G together with natural transformations between F and G circ. And because F and G are really in, in, uh, in the same role here and, and, and product is, is, is symmetric, then also pairs of functors F and G together with natural transformation from G to F circ. Why is this? This can be seen intuitively, also just knowing logic, not necessarily category theory. So an interaction law between two functors is a family of maps like this, right? 
But then we could curry, we could move GY to the other side uh, and put the function space sign, right? But then uh, I'm in a situation where uh, the variable Y only occurs on the right-hand side, which means I can move the global quantification to, 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 to quantification on one side. This is just logic, yeah? Um, and that is literally the definition of dual, right? So therefore, any interaction law, for example, between F and G actually factors through uh, anti interaction law between G circ and G. And the good thing is these things can be calculated using the Yoneda yoga. <laughs> and somebody asked me, does times become arrow and arrow becomes times and to a degree. So let's do the calculation in a few cases. I'm actually not doing the calculation. You could also program it all up in, in Haskell and, and prove, I mean, this, this is, sorry. This is something that you can code up in Haskell using uh, rank two polymorphism, uh, which is available via some language pragma. When I was young, I, all I had to say was F Glasgow X. Now you have to state very many language pragmas and you've got no idea what they're called. Um, Why can't I move? Uh, but, but here is the dual calculated in some cases. So for constant zero, you get constant one. For the co-product of two functors, you get a product of two functors. For constant one, you get constant zero, but then start, things start to get slightly sour and we have to go slower. <laughs> so for a functor, which is a constant object times some other functor, this turns into constant object arrows, the dual of that other functor, Yeah, so I mean, this is not generally between for, for, for the product of two functors, but one of them is constant. You see this, just, just a fixed object A. Uh, and that gets more complicated with function space. So for the particular functor A arrows Y, so A is a fixed object, Y is our parameter here. You do get this times, this arrows becomes times. Uh, general exponents don't work at all. I mean, an exponent between two functors, but we could say constant object and the functor. When you dualize, then A times the dual of G prime is kind of right, but it's not isomorphic to the dual of G circ. You only get the natural transformation in one direction. So, so this guy is a good approximation in one direction, but it's not the right answer. The dual of identity is identity, but again, the dual of composition of two functors, and this already is a special case here, is not the composition of, of the duals of the two. And then we know some special cases that I already told you. So for example, if G supports a nullary or a binary commutative operation, then it's necessary uh, in categories with well-behaved coproducts that circ of G is just the empty set, which is very boring. But at least you can calculate these things. Right. Um, now, um, a good news is that to, dual, that to dualize a co co-monad is not more complicated than to dualize a functor. So what you need to do is you dualize the underlying functor, you get some functor, and it turns out that this functor you can canonically equip with a monad structure somehow produced from the co-monad structure of what you started out with. Uh, there is a nonsense, sort of general nonsense reason why this happens, namely dualization as a functor itself is lax monoidal. So it sends monoids to monoids. And now co-monads are monoids in this category. So therefore, they are sent to monoids in this category and they are monads. Uh, but of course, you can write it out concretely, which I think is done in the Haskell code here. So uh, there is a general dualization thing somewhere. Where is it? The dual of a functor, you see. Can you see both screens? Somebody tell me. Very good. Sometimes it's not very clear uh, here from the interface. So you see, you can define the dual of a functor uh, 
just as I said, using rank two polymorphism, that's perfectly legal Haskell. It was a Haskell 98 extension in early days. And then uh, as soon as D is a co-monad, the dual of D obtains a monad structure. And this is made in some way, uh, which takes some time to read what happens, but, but, but you can do that. Uh, and here is some more stuff that I say. Obviously, any functor interacts. Uh, sorry, uh, if we've got a functor, then the dual is also functor, but also any functor interacts with its dual. And of course, any uh, any comona then interacts with its dual. Uh, 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 monad. Um, <clears throat> But now comes the interesting part. <laughs> on, the, on the level of nonsense, <laughs> this dualization functor is not oplax monoidal, so it doesn't send commonoids to commonoids, which here would mean to send monads to comonads. So if you just dual the underlying functor of a monad, you do get some functor, but th that one doesn't necessarily carry a comonad structure. Bad news, because that's the direction we would generally like to go. The interesting direction is I've got some notion of computation. I want to work out the universal notion of environment, right? That is the main direction of interest. You could also start with, I've got some machine, who could I serve? <laughs> so that's like starting with a notion of environment and figuring out what's the corresponding notion of computation. But yeah, we, we're here de dealing with a sort of more interesting one and that is the hard one. So what do you do when you can't do the perfect thing? So uh, the dual is not a co-monad. Um, uh, there is still a construction. There is a universal construction. Uh, so you can't talk about the dual of T, but you can talk about what is called the Swedler dual. So this is kind of a wannabe dual or like the best thing you can have closest to it. So what is it informally? Um, Informally, it's the following thing. You, dual, you dualize T, you get some functor T circ. T circ is ne not necessarily a comonad, but then you try to make a smaller, then you try to go smaller and you find, try to find the greatest functor D that is smaller than it. And that all of a sudden you can equip with a comonad structure. Um, and I call the co-unit and the co-multiplication eta bullet and mu bullet, um, which are somehow related to what the duals of eta and mu are. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, dualization is a functor, so it doesn't only send uh, functors to functors, but it has to send natural transformations to natural transformations, because natural transformations, after all, are what is the right notion of map between two functors. Okay. So one could write out what this means, um, but it is complicated and involved. Uh, but, but it literally formalizes it, this intuition that, the, that we are after the best possible thing. So we dualize, we go a little smaller. So we're going to mona T, we dualize the underlying functor, we get T circ. Then we look for something from which there would be a natural transformation to T circ. Um, that actually has um, a comonad structure, which you can see here, which then compares well to what are uh, uh, the duals of what uh, of the unit and multiplication of the given monad. And the reason why why you can't just take T circ itself is that something breaks here. Um, which is a, again the thing that I already told you, the dual of the composition of two functors is not the composition of duals. So you have a map in this direction, but in, in order for me to just declare that eta bullet and mu bullet, I'd like them to take to be eta circ and mu circ, I'd need a map in the opposite direction, which just doesn't generally exist. So you look for something like this, and then you look for the universal one like this. So then it's like always with universal properties, you look at other candidates and you say, all the other candidates are worse than you. So there have to be unique mediating maps to you. Okay. Um, here is something that I can only sort of flash to you, but it's actually written in the Haskell code and you can check. So funny things then now happen. So uh, I already told you 
that the non-empty list, which is our extensional notion of binary non-determinism, is bad because it supports an associative operation. So it can't really interact very well with co-monads. And then really we get interesting phenomena because I can dualize non-empty lists as a functor. So non-empty lists are what? They are non-empty lists, but you, with dependent types, you can also say every list is a choice of a length and then uh, an assignment of a data value to, uh, to every position uh, fitting into that length. Uh, according to the formula I provided, I'm allowed to change this dependent uh, product into a dependent function space and this function space into product. And this is the dual of T as a functor. But the dual of T as a co-monad, the Sweden dual, is something poorer. Uh, so there is just a Y here, which is the initial state. And then you can once turn to the left or the right. And basically what is captured here is you have to keep turning in the same direction, which then means if, you represent, if, if your non-empty lists came from flattening a leaf tree, then you can only reach the leftmost leaf or the rightmost leaf in the tree. And in terms of the leaf list, it is the uh, leftmost element of the list, the first element of the list ahead, and then the last element of the list. The state monad is also funny. So the, here's your extensional state monad. Uh, the Swedish dual is what you'd expect, the co-state co-monad. Yeah. But if you just forgot that this was a monad, if you try to dualize it, just following my formulas that I gave in a little table, uh, then you get something different. Then you get this. And look, this is funny. Uh, I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from the fact that this type here is isomorphic to this one. And now I've got what? Constant times some functor and then constant arrow some functor here identity. And this means I can allow, uh, I can change these times to arrows and these arrows to times based on my formulas. So that's the sort of bureaucratic, uh, no brainer way of arriving here, just following the recipes. But what happens on the intuitive level is very funny, right? This computation wants to read and then write and maybe do some internal steps in between. <laughs> but the environment says, you want to read, but I won't allow you to read. You first tell me what you do with what you read. So I ask, what is the state transformation on your side? <laughs> if you tell me that, so if you tell me what you do with what I will give you, then I'll give you the thing. And then I finish. And there is, there is Haskell code for that somewhere here. And I just invite you to to read it. So this is this dual of state thing here. And that's the functor functor interaction law between state and dual of state, which really goes like this. I ask, and you tell me, I, I won't tell you. I'll just ask, I, I counter your question with my question. You tell me what you do, then I'll give you. Now, as ever, I'm too late, but, um, but let me do one little thing still, because this is to connect up interaction laws and handlers and co-handlers. So I told you interaction laws are something about uh, the computation you have talking to an environment somebody gives and they follow a protocol, right? So the, the two don't per se have a common language, uh, so then the interaction law says how the two are sort of weaved together. Uh, and there can be many ways, there can be more than one interaction law for two functors or for a monad and a co-monad. <clears throat> so the explanation of how this is related closer to handlers and co-handlers, of course, goes via algebras and co-algebras because this is what handlers and co-handlers are. So let me just tell you one little fact and then we contemplate. Um, so it turns out that um, if you are given two things, so on one hand, um, monad-comonad interaction law, let it be residual. So let R also be present. So then it's more general. 
to a natural transformation like this, subject to equations, uh, le let us also have around uh, uh, a, a Co-Allenberg more co-algebra, so a co-monad co-algebra for D. So, so here, Y is, um, is a variable. Uh, so, I mean, uh, psi is indexed over all X and Y, but here there is a specific Y for which actually I have a map from Y to DY. So, I, and I told you, this is a way to blow up an initial state into a whole environment, which you could, for example, do if you um, had a little functor algebra around in the uh, functor algebra around in, in, in case the commonad was a co-free commonad. That then is the dynamics of a of a little state machine. So if you have these two things, I can I can sort of merge them together into something else. So it's a natural transformation type Tx times y to R of x times y. The difference being the D is gone. And the other difference being is y is a constant object. So I'm only indexed by x and naturally in x, y is fixed. And you get it like this. So you just apply your interaction law, you precompose the interaction law with basically this co-algebra. And these things I knew before interaction laws and I call them stateful runners because it's a story about how do you, given, uh, given an effectful computation, how can I possibly given some initial state or give, given some extra information, which you can think of a state, how can I extract one single value out of it? Well, one single value in the case R is not present. And here there is a more general case. And you can describe these things. And, uh, and there is, again, two quality criteria. When do you want to call a finger runner? But it's literally about running things. So like, if you've got a stateful computation, you would think, you only need the initial state to actually extract the value. So we had a little discussion on Slack about whether you can or cannot model, uh, sorry, see uh, seeding a stateful computation with an initial state as a handler or not. Uh, there is two possible answers. I mean, you, you kind of can, and I, I hinted at this yesterday, but it's not as naive as you would think. Uh, it's, it's more complicated. Here, it is, here you can do very naively. Um, <clears throat> Okay, now uh, I, I want to sort of give a more general view of this. And this is based on, again, looking at things differently. So uh, monad commonad interaction law can be seen as a thing like this, naturally in X and Y subject to equations. But then you uh, can apply Yoneda, <laughs> which means this you can see as a function in sets that takes any map from X times Y to Z to a map from TX times DY to RZ naturally in X and Y. And then you can curry and then you can apply Yoneda again. And then you can also say an interaction law is something that takes T of Y arrow Z to D Y arrow RZ, or also you can swap the roles of D and T here, cutting uh, or sort of using symmetry and cutting differently. So how, how do you think of these things? Now I'd like to sort of give further legends. X was always values, Y is states. Zs we could see are observable from state and from value and state pairs. Um, right. <clears throat> and there are cases <clears throat> where you cannot extract single value from a computation, but when you can observe. And uh, this especially has to do with, with examples from probability, but I can't go to them right now. But this is this is one nice picture. And then it turns out that this view is particularly useful. Uh, which one? So you say an interaction law is something that takes a computation over dependencies of observables on states and turns it into a function that sends an environment to a residual computation over observables. Now, it turns out that it's easy to show it's actually on the next slide, but maybe we won't have time to go through it. That in the interaction law in this format, actually, you can see as a functor on algebras and co-algebras. So to have an interaction law is the same thing as to get a co-algebra of D, which is a co-handler, right? It's something that takes, so it's, it's, a, it's given by a fixed object Y and a map from Y to D of Y. So something that blows up 
any initial state into an environment starting at that state. Any initial state from the given state space, I should say, right? So you take on one hand this, then you take a handler of R. So it's a handler of residual computations. So this is some fixed set of observables and the handler for those. And then it turns out an interaction law is nothing else than something that systematically combines a co-handler for D and a handler for R into a handler for T, but not for an arbitrary carrier, but the only thing that you can handle are functions from Y to Z or sort of dependencies of observables on states. Right. So basically what this says, now this is a unified sort of approach to, uh, to handling and interaction. We can talk about interaction between uh, computation and environment, but we could say, suppose I can handle my residual computations, like maybe in some way, yeah, with some default value for a, for a particular type of observables. Suppose also I can co-handle, so I can produce the environment from a given from any given uh, initial state in the, set, in the set Y, capital Y, then having these things together with interaction means now I can handle my computations, my original computations, which were here in this case, not over arbitrary values, but over dependencies of, of observables on states. Yeah. Um, Here's the actual construction, which uh, is kind of pathetically simple <laughs> in some way. So for example, if you've got the interaction law and want to produce this functor, so you're given interaction law, you've given some uh, handler and, uh, uh, and the co-handler, all you need to do is you have to apply the interaction law at yz. So you go from t of yz y arrow z to d y arrows r z and then you use functoriality of function space combined with z and xi which are your handler and co-handler uh, and you are here because r z is sent to z and y is sent to dy but that happens in in a negative position so we can read it uh, yeah it works backwards and the other direction is not harder what is even funnier is this picture is finer so there is intermediate bijection so on one hand Monad commonad interaction laws, residual ones, are in bijection with these functors that send coalgebras and algebras to algebras in a way that exponentiates carriers, right? So if this one has carrier y, this one has carrier z, the, the algebra we get back has carrier y arrow z. But you can carry here and you could say, well, uh, could I see these things as um, functors from just co-algebras of D to some interesting place or functors from uh, algebras of R to some interesting place. And then you can. And it, then it turns out that these places are things uh, interesting in their own right. So here you do get functors from co-algebras to what we call residual stateful runners. And here you get what we call fueled continuation-based runners of T. Uh, I should really stop here. Maybe I'll show you these two slides. So, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, what is a stateful runner? I showed you what a stateful runner was. So, uh, for a fixed y, um, a runner of t, so a runner of computations in t, uh, starting in a state y, is um, uh, or in, in, in a state drawn from capital Y is, is a natural transformation like this. So Y is fixed, but X is variable. And you go from T of X times Y to R of X times Y. So from a computation of X, you extract a single X or in a bad case, like you need a maybe here or so, it will be like a smaller or, or, or less effectful monad applied to X times Y. These, you can characterize by two conditions, but also you can characterize them simply. Oh, again, by currying, actually, let's move this Y to the other side. If you've done monad transformers before, you realize this is nothing else than uh, 
the state monad for state set Y transformed by the monad R, isn't it? Like you combine state with non-determinism or state with maybe, then you plug the extra monad here and then apply it to uh, an object of values X. And the two equations you have here are exactly the equations for a monad morphism. So we could say a runner is just basically a reduction of a computation in an arbitrary monad to a computation in an R transformed state monad. So any, any computation is basically, the, the idea is to interpret any computation if we can, any notion of computation as stateful computation. And it cannot be done perfectly. Sometimes you need a residual monad, but sometimes you can put identity here. And these in turn are the same actually as um, functors that send handlers of R to handlers of T in such a way that if the carrier here is Y, Sorry, if the carrier here is uh, Z, then the carrier here is Y arrow Z. So they, uh, they can exp uh, exponentiate the carrier. So that's fun. So somehow interaction has lots to do with uh, these transformed state monads uh, under this view. And the final one is continuation-based runners. So that's kind of the dual game. <clears throat> so an interaction law, you could also say uh, is the following or is related to the following thing. Uh, let me go back to a slide. So I said an interaction law takes me, <coughs> will take me from, uh, uh, from a handler of R to a continuation based runner of T. So if I know, if somebody gives me a handler of R with carrier Z, then I can work out the continuation based runner for T um, that actually uh, uses uh, Z. Um, as the answer uh, uh, object of the continuation monad. So let me define a few things. Then for any Z that I talked about, uh, a D-fueled continuation-based runner, you could say is such a thing that's like an interaction law, except that the monad R is gone from this place. I've kind of morally gotten rid of it because there will be a handler sort of in the context that I can use. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and again, by currying and here changing the order of arguments, that's the same thing as maps from Tx to this function space. That looks almost like the continuations monad for answer object Z applied to object X, isn't it? Except that there is a co-monad in a way. In the way, I should say. <laughs> So that's a bit unusual, right? We know a lot about uh, maybe uh, monad transformers. So here is also a monad transformer, but I've transformed a monad using a co-monad, which I plug it into a negative position in my monad expression. And those are in bijection with, with what I need, uh, namely these uh, functors that exponentiate carriers and send uh, uh, co-handlers of D to handlers of T. Uh, because what did I do? Uh, I wanted to have a, a sort of different view of this thing. I changed the order of arguments. I say, okay, now I've got functors in EMR. So morally, this guy should be the same as this functor category going from here to here and exponentiating carriers. And that's exactly this bit here. So I've run over time. Let me, let me sum up. There is some more slides which show you how you can go far more general with this game. But what I've showed here, and what you can read for yourself in Haskell, and what I'll be happy to comment on indefinitely in Slack is, is then this paradigm that uh, we model monads with, uh, sorry, with computations with monads. Computations uh, don't like to be alone. They like, uh, they, they like cooperation with, uh, we're sort of matching counterparts, these environments. If you put a computation and an environment together, normally you get a closed system that sort of can run fully independently and produce uh, a return value and a final state. For some notions of computation, it doesn't work like we discussed. Uh, exceptions or, or notions of non-determinism that are too intentional. So they involve, for example, commutativity or associativity. Then we can uh, say, okay, yeah, we, we cannot fully do the interaction, but, but, but at least we reduce the amount of effect. You know? 
And then these are related to, so, so interaction laws then describe how computations and environments match together and can cooperate. And the whole thing is related to handlers in the sense of deep handlers and co-handlers in the sense of sort of an abstraction of machines. Uh, in that you actually can see uh, interaction laws as basically a means that tells you, which is the most important thing here, that tells you how do you get a handler in a canonical way for the original notion of computation you have in mind, provided you can handle your observables and provided you can co-handle your state. Um, right, and then if, if, if you can do both, then you can handle your original computation, but only for, for these type of um, carriers. That's actually related to now using uh, this uh, uh, seeding, seeding the stateful computation with an initial state. So if you want to, to see this as a handler, you can't use the, the value types that you have in mind. You actually have to make it a functional and dependency on the state, which I already showed um, uh, in the Slack channel today. But well, that's like a side remark for those that ask. I'd like to, to stop here. Uh, this, was, this was my story. I hope you got something from it. Thanks for bearing with me. Do look at the Haskell. Um, volunteer to write some Agda that proves everything. I also have some Agda lying around. Uh, it's a fun thing. It was, re it was a parts of it have been invented independently by people like Edward Kmet, but more seriously, Phil Freeman and a student of his. So some of the relevant words to, to look for would be coupling uh, or pairing. So uh, uh, Phil Freeman and Edward Kmet have used these terms. And funnily, they started uh, from, uh, from a co-monad and were dualizing it to a monad, which is the easy part. And then the other direction, finding for a monad, the universal co-monad, which is the Swedish dual, is the, is the hard part. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tarmo, for the uh, great lectures. Um, uh, we might have time. I don't know if there's any questions. We might have time for a quick question. I, I'm happy to answer any number of questions, provided I don't run into any other anyone else's <laughs> time. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, you're welcome to ask. Uh, most yeah. Of so, you know, if not, I think we'll uh, wrap up for lunch. And you know, me and all of the organizers just wanted to thank you so much for coming and giving your. Um, giving your lectures here and, and presenting in material to the students. I think everyone here really appreciated it. Um, yeah. Thank you and thanks, thanks for inviting me. It was an enormous honor and it's always fun to uh, talk to uh, well-motivated students. Um, now this might have been the, uh, the, the most categorical course. I'm not sure what Alexandra uh, <laughs> did to you or will do but uh, <laughs> at least one of the most uh, theoretical ones in this direction. But I think it's fun and I think it's very, very relevant to, to FP. If you want to see more of this stuff, look at, check the, check the online book by Bartosz Milewski, for example, he has amazing stuff and all the blog posts by SIGFB and, um, and, uh, and Edward Kmet, for example. If she works to conclude, can uh, someone hear me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sorry, I cannot share my screen because I don't know, I have, I have the wrong version of, uh, of Zoom or whatever. I wanted to show you the certificate for you, to thank you for your participation in uh, your lectures at OPLSS 2021. And I'd like to say on behalf of all the students of OPLSS, uh, I would like to say thank you, Tarmo, for your lectures. We are really happy you took the time to teach us about monads. And I think the lectures were, were great. And I'm sure that everyone here will agree with, with me. You helped me a lot uh, have a better theoretical background on monads and, uh, and gave me actual, an actual practical ex example on why a category theory is important. So yeah, thank you again, Tarno. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh...